35, Exodus chapter 35, and once you have found it, let's all stand as we read the Word of God, Exodus chapter 35, and from this point forward, I want to ask everybody just to um, sit still and not move around in the services. Um, there are people that come to church to listen, and when people get up and move around, it really, it really disturbs everyone else. So if you could just um, um, respect everybody, that would really help us out a whole lot. Exodus chapter 35, and we're going to start reading in verse 4. Exodus chapter 35 and verse 4. If you have it, give me a good strong amen. Yeah. Scripture says, And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded, the tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his tackies, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, the ark, and the staves thereof, with the mercy seat, and the veil of the covering, the table, and his staves, and all his vessels, and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture, and his lamps with the oil for the light. I want to take this verse right here. I often, be honest with you, um, I read in the scriptures and then God speaks to my heart. And then I say to myself, I think this would be good for the church. And so I take what God gives me and I bring it to you. That's how I get my sermons. This is one of those truths one morning I was reading and it just kind of, Something just kind of jumped out here that was really, I thought, would be helpful to a lot of people. I want to talk to you this morning on this topic, guides for life. Guides Amen. for life. Father, now take these next few minutes. Lord, allow me to be a help to your people. I know that we've come expecting you to give us something from your word, and we're here. Now, Father, would you honor them for coming? May we learn something today that we can apply to our life and where we're lacking, help us to do better in this area, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The passage of Scripture that we just read, God, they, the children of Israel are in the wilderness and Moses, God commanded Moses to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. Now, as he commanded them, he told them all the things that were to be done. Now, you'll notice they take an offering for this right here. That's what it talks about right here when we begin to read in verse 4. He says, or verse 5, take ye from among you an offering. So Moses, he comes to the people and he says to them, he says, now, now this is what I need for the offering. And he says, because we've got the ephod, we've got to put on the high priest, we've got the, we've got the badger skin, we need to make use for the tent. And he goes through all of these things that they're going to need. But then he comes down, and this is what really grabbed my attention. What he said right here was in verse 14. He says, the candlestick also for the light and his furniture and his lamps. It's interesting, he comes as he talks about all these things. Get this now. This tabernacle had no windows in it. The only, the only thing that was going to give them light, there was, of course, the, the tabernacle is divided into two rooms. We have on, we'll make this side the holy place. And over here was the holy place. Then you have one other room. I, I should have turned it around because you're over here. But this is, I saw that little smirk. And this is the holy of holies. Now, you only went into this room once, the high priest went in here once a year. But now, in, in this room, there was no light. And in that room, there was no light. In th now, in this room, get this now, when the high priest went in, the, the glory of God is what gave the light in this room. It was a symbol that one day when we get to heaven, 
Jesus is the light. And you don't need any other light other than Jesus Christ. That blood shed on that mercy seat, and that is good enough light. That's all you need as you come inside of here. But in this room that God says, now I want some candlesticks in this room. These candlesticks are what give light in this room right here. Now, in order for the candlestick to work, they needed oil. That's how they burnt their, that's how their candles burnt back in those days. How many of you, how many of you remember those old, um, what, the, keros, the, the lanterns, you know what I'm talking about? You put the oil on the inside and it, and it burns and you, sometimes you have an old-fashioned service and turn out the lights and go to those old, those old um, lanterns right there. And those are exciting times to be able to do that. But can I tell you, you have this golden candlestick and the oil right there and that's the only thing that gives light in this part, in the holy place of the tabernacle. I began to think. I began to think about that tabernacle. That priest needed light to be able to go to the table of uh, showbread. He needed light to be able to go to the altar of incense. He needed that light to be able to see where he was going to go. Without that light, he was feeling himself around, trying to find, because he didn't have to worry once he got over there. God would always show up. God always shows up at the mercy seat. You get saved today, and I'll tell you right now, God will show up and save your soul and take you to heaven one day when you die hey he always shows up at the mercy seat but over here over here he's here and he and he need, I can see him trying to fill around no light because the candlesticks didn't weren't there oh no God says I want you to know what you're doing I don't want you to roam in darkness get this now I, I want you to have light to know what you're doing at the table of showbread, at the altar of incense, at the candlesticks right there. I want you to see what you're doing as you serve me. I thought of this though. Here's the critical thought. Imagine the candlestick is in there, but no oil. Candlesticks ready to burn, but no oil. To feel the burning for the light. Imagine having the oil in this holy place. But no candlestick inside of that holy place. Get this now. The oil without the candlestick will not help you. The candlestick without the oil cannot help you. It takes the candlestick and it takes the oil to give you, get this now ready, to give you light to help you to be able to see where you're going. Have you ever been somewhere in your life where it seems like you're walking in darkness? You don't know what decision to make. You're in a dark place of your life. You're in that dark place trying to make decisions about life. Understand, one bad decision can turn your life around for bad. We want to make the right decisions inside of life. But we walk sometimes in those dark days. There's no clarity. You know, you go through days. We've had a lot of death inside of our church lately of people passing away. And those can be dark days at times as you're trying to figure out, man, what is going on? Or maybe you're financially struggling and you're walking through the dark days of not knowing what decision do I need to make right now? Or maybe you're going through family problems and, uh, and it seems like there's no, you, it seems like your decision making is dark and your life is dark and you can't see where you're going. You're in the dark days of what you cannot see. You say, preacher, what do I do? Preacher, what is it that I need as I go through these days? Oftentimes, I have preacher or people come to me and they say, preacher, I just don't know what to do right now. I was reading this passage of Scripture and I realized that, that when Jesus was talking about the candlestick and the oil being for light, God was giving us a, something, a little truth, that could help us to get the guides of life, the information of life that we need to be able to make decisions in those dark days. 
Follow me very carefully. Circle the word candlestick, if you would, and put this beside it, the church. The church. The candlestick is always a picture, a type of the church. In the book of Revelation, and he talks about the seven candlesticks. What was, and, he, and then he goes on, and he begins to go a little further, and he talks about to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Laodicea, to the church of Philadelphia, to the church of Pergamos. And he goes to each one of those seven churches. Why? Because each one represents, because the golden candlestick, it, was, it had a total of seven little um, things coming up. And God says, I want you, because there's a number of, that seven is a number of perfection in God eyes. God says this is the completeness. The church will help complete you in life if you stay faithful to church. It helps you grow in the Lord. It gives you the information you need in those dark days. And so I circled that word candlestick which represents the church. Then I, re- I circled the word oil. Oil, if you'll circle that word and put next to it, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now follow me very carefully. Isaiah 61.1 says, Isaiah said that he was anointed. In the, in, the, in the days of the priest, they would come. And if I could use your Brother Williams real quick. The days of the priest, they went, when they were going to anoint a king, we're going to anoint you a king. That, that, that priest, that, 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 that prophet would take the oil and pour it on the head. That oil was a type of the Holy Spirit that was supposed to guide this man as he led God's people. That's what it was for. Now get this now, thank you. God says that we need oil in this land. What do we need? We need the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, how we need the Holy Spirit of God to work inside of our churches today. And we need the Holy Spirit of God to work inside of our lives today. Can I tell you? If you're saved today, you have access to all of the Holy Spirit that you'll ever need because he came all the way inside of you. But the problem is today, a lot of times God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't have access to all of us because we pull ourselves away from God and we shut him off in different times of our life. And God says, would you open me yourself up? Would you let my Holy Spirit have all of you? You you have all of him. You got saved. You have access to all the Holy Spirit. Would you also let the Holy Spirit have all of you so he can guide you into those days when you're going through the dark days of life that Holy Spirit can guide you so we first of all we have let's do a little review class we have the candlestick the candlestick represents talk to me now represents the church the church then we have the what we have the oil talk to me now we have the what the oil that represents who that represents the Holy Spirit but hold on there's a third word Light. Light. Circle that word light. Put this beside it. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. John 9, 5, Jesus says, is as long as I am in the world, he says, I am the light of the world. I saw that. And I thought to myself, that's what we need. If I'm going to get dark guidance in dark days. Now, now some of you, you, you're not in those dark days. The sun's shining brightly. It's a blue sky in your life right now. Just like what you go out today. I was coming to church today and talking to the two gentlemen that rode with me to church. We were talking, man, beautiful blue sky today. But can I tell you, there are days that you're in dark skies. There's days you don't see the sun. There's days that, like you all had um, here a little bit earlier this week. I was out of town, so I, I say you all. But I, I mean, I, we were where the sun was shining. I don't know what's wrong with you guys. But anyway, and, but the fog had dropped down. You know what I'm talking about. And you can't see what you're doing. Oh, can I tell you? in those dark days we've got to have something to guide us to give us the information of life so okay so I looked at this let's talk about them first of all God gives you three tools in life to give you guidance in life the first one is the church the church I want you to listen to me and I want you to listen carefully to this I know you hear me say this but I want you to listen you come to one service a week and you're missing the other Three services that will guide you in your life. You're not getting all you need. You don't understand. 
Every service is, is a different message. And I prepare a sermon by what God gives me to help our church. And for some reason, I don't know what it is, but God works through the pastor to help guide us. But yet many a time we miss that thing. And someday, what, let me tell you what's going to happen. Some of you who don't think that church is important, one day it's going to come dark. And you're going to look back one day and you're going to say, man, if I had just been at church because there was a sermon preached that I wasn't there, you better be there. Why? Because God's giving you something that can help you when the dark days are going to come. I may not need it now, but I'm going to need it tomorrow I can't tell you how many times when I'm going through these tough times my mind goes back to a church service where I heard a preacher preach and the Holy Spirit begins to give me what I need not because of what I got today but what I got yesterday by being faithful to church understand I've got to have God's word. I need it taught to me. Church is that thing that gives me light. Church is that thing that gives me the help. Church is that thing that gives me the guidance. How does it guide me? It guides me by the, by the, by the example of those who lead us. You're a young Christian. You say, how do I grow in the Lord? Well, look at those who are leading it, and hopefully they're leading a godly life. And you can say, okay, I see that's how I'm supposed to live my life. Why? Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but what? Exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what exhorting is? Exhorting is not just cheering up somebody. Hey, cheer up. Put a smile on that face. Hey, yeah, there you go. Hey, hey, yeah, hey. And cheering up is... I didn't say that. And I tear up. Say that's my thing. And I, this is my son in law. I can really beat him up. And uh, I'd get child abuse for this one over here. But anyway, and so I come over here and I would, and I would, and I, and exhorting is being an example. Being an example. Don't fall asleep in church. I don't fall asleep. Example. It exhorts us. I come to church as a teenage boy. And I sit under Brother Williams. And I learn as a teenage boy how to live like a man in today's world. So want to help me out. I come to Brother Turk's Sunday school class. And I learn how as a young couple I can make it in life and have godly children. I come to I come to Brother Trimble's class as a young adult teacher and I and I learn how to live as a young adult in a world that is against the young I'm being exhorted. I come to Brother I come to Brother Hall's class and I don't learn a thing. But no, I, I come to Brother Hall's class. And I don't know where that came from. I come to Brother Hall's class, and I'm a junior high boy, and I sit there and I learn I can still be godly as a teenage boy. I go to Miss Trela's class as a as a lady Sunday school teacher. Not me, um, Brother Turk does. But 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 I, but I go to her class. I can learn how, as a widow lady, you can still serve God and give God your best in these days. What am I doing? I'm being exhorted. Church, I can't stress enough. This thing of being faithful. I'm not doing it because I want a crowd. I'm doing it because I want to help you. To get truths that will help you. I beg God every week and I say, God, give me a truth that will help our church, that will help them to grow and help them to make it through the hard times and you miss a Sunday night service. You miss a Wednesday night service. You miss a Sunday morning service every once in a while. And, and, and what you're doing is you're missing part of the light. Imagine if that candlestick only had one of those seven burning. You need church. This man moved here from Kansas to come to a church like this because he liked what he was hearing from the Word of God and he wanted himself and his family to get involved in a church like this. And he's been faithful the whole time. This man over here moved here from North Carolina to marry my daughter, not to come to church, no. 
He came here from North Carolina to come to this church to be a part of a church like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that you think I'm just saying it because I'm, ba- I'm the pastor, but there are not many churches like this. And I'm saying, but part of the things that God uses to guide you, it is the church. Be faithful to church. Come tonight. Come on Wednesday night. I'm amazed how flippant we are about attending church. What is this church? You mean to tell me you're going to watch a football game instead of getting a truth? Now listen to me. I I love sports. Our team won last night. Barely, but we won. We're not going to talk about the team that owes everybody everything. People stay up late on Saturday night, and I'm not talking to you. People stay up late on Saturday night watching football games and won't come on Sunday morning. And they don't think anything about it. What they don't know is they're missing out. They're missing out on some guides that can help them inside of life. Listen, I've been going to church my entire life, and I'm telling you, even when I was just a lay person, I made sure I was in church in Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Why? Because I wanted to make sure that in those dark days, I've got the answer from God's Word. Can I tell you something else? You need, not only do you need church, you need light. Who's that light? Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the light of the world. What's so big about the light? Well, you go back to John 1, 1. And Jesus says, in the beginning was the word. How do I get Jesus involved in my life? His word. His word. You want to know why I read this book every day? I need God to guide me every day. I, I, listen to me. As important as church is, so is the Word of God. I want this, I want the people here to be people of the Word. I want you to know the Word of God. I want you to memorize the Word of God. I want to be a part of you. I want you to be able to look in that book and say, I've got the answers. Where did it come from? Not the preacher. It came from God's Word. Can I ask you a question? Don't answer it out loud. How much Bible have you read this week other than the church services? You're in a dark world. You can't see where you're going. The Bible's not the thing that you leave closed. First place you run to when, you, when the darkness is, run to God's Word. Run to God's Word. These past two weeks, been kind of tough on your preacher. I don't, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I'm just saying it's been tough because of all the death. And I take it personal. To do the funerals. And watch people grieve. Kills me on the inside. And I so long want to help them. I saw that family here on Friday two caskets, one here and one over there. Family had come to the original funeral thinking that they were only going to celebrate the life of Jack Clark and they got there and they see his son right next to him in another casket. Preacher, how did you make it? I'm trying to help a church, pastor a church, go so what in, study for the regular services, and yet now I've got two funerals somehow I've got a plan for. And how do you do that? I run to this book right here. And I say, God, I need some light today. I don't know what, I, what to do, but I need some light today. And can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I want, let me tell you a little secret. In the darkest days of life, if you spend time in this book, that book becomes more alive in the dark days than it will in the easy days. Am I right, Brother Heidenreich? You're in the dark days of life. 
That's not time to run to alcohol and drugs and, and social media and everything else. Go to God's Word and, and go and find the balm of God's Word that can be anointed on the wound that's hurting on the inside. And God's Word just somehow comes alive in those times. I can't tell you, it's just like, man, it's, the words are just there and so much truth that God's given you in that time. And I think it's part of God putting his arm around you and saying it's going to be okay. What do you do? You're walking through the dark days of life. I can't see where to go. What do I do? Well, don't miss church. What do I do? Read his word. But can I tell you something else? Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. That oil is so important. Try running a car without oil. Now, I'd advise you not to. Everyone sit down. There's people behind you can't see. Help me out over here. Brother, Brother Sanui, help me out. Understand, there's oil that we need. We need the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. We need that oil. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's the one that gives us the comfort that helps us to have the joy in the dark days of life. I come to church and I get exhorted in church. I read God's word and I'm fed the words of God. Amen. But I go to the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, I need your guidance. John 16, 13 says, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. In those dark days, the Holy Spirit takes you by the arm. He says, I'll guide you if you yield to me. Don't fight me now. Don't fight me because I will guide you. You say, how does he do that? He does it through his word. He does it through the church. And so he, he's going through dark days, and he fights the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. And the Holy Spirit will never impose himself on you. If you pull away, he backs off. Go ahead. Close your eyes. Just walk around. Just walk around. You might want to be careful over there now. A lot of people go through this right here. Let me tell you what you ought to do. I'm right here. As soon as you open your eyes, you yield. I can guide you. There's steps you need to take in life. <laughs> Yield to the Holy Spirit. Can I give you a prayer that you need to pray several times a day? Holy Spirit, I yield myself to Thee. Guide me in my decisions, my words my actions, and all that I do. Amen. In those dark days, the Holy Spirit will, what you've heard in church, what you didn't think you needed, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit brings a thought back that you heard in the preaching time. And all of a sudden, when you're yielding to the Holy Spirit, he brings a word from, the, from God's word. Now understand, Holy Spirit never leads you to do something that's against this book right here. So don't come to me and say, well, the Holy Spirit told me when it's against God's word. He says, I want to, lie. I want to guide you, but you've got to yield. Here's the problem. There's some, they're missing the candlestick. They got the oil on the inside, but the oil's worthless without a candlestick. 
There's some, they come to church, but they don't have any oil to get. They don't have that. That, that oil's not there because they don't even have, they, there's no light. They can't have the light. They're not reading God's word. There's some that they read the Bible and they go to church, but they never yield to the Holy Spirit. And all three are needed. All three are needed. Are you going through dark days? You ever been in a dark room? You ever walk into a dark room? This room is, you turn it off, there ain't nothing. It's dark. And you know, you think you know where something is until your knee hits the corner of something. Somebody help me out. And you're trying to praise the Lord while you're hitting your knee. It's just easier just to turn the light on. I'm talking to some of you today. You're walking through dark days. You're in a dark room. You don't know what to do. I was, can't tell you a story. I was in, got back from the airport or from traveling on Wednesday. Told my wife, said, let's go to Cracker Barrel, go to Cracker Barrel. I run into Miss Linda over here. Needing some truth in life. I come over and I see her. She goes, Preacher, I, I got extra okra for you. <laughs> yeah, she hadn't been in church enough. I can tell you that right there. She said, what does that have to do with the sermon? Nothing. I just told her I want to point her out. <laughs> I'm talking to a lot of you tonight. You ought to be in church tonight. Yeah. Six o'clock, you ought to be in church. Hey. Yeah. See, it's a long drive. Is it is, okay? Is making a right decision worth the drive? Oh. I'm tired. Okay. Is going to church? Uh, I look at Brother Troy. Where are you, Brother Troy? I saw you somewhere right over here. Man, he gets up. I think you go to work at 3 o'clock in the morning. Is that right? Then it goes to work at 3 o'clock, and he's here on Sunday nights. So don't tell me that, you, well, I'm tired. Well, he's, at, he's going to work. At the, he drives a bus at night time. Now, now, somewhere we've got to say, is it real what we're doing? Then let's be in church. Is it real what we're doing? Then read his word. Is it real what we're doing? Then yield to the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth some of you though listen now carefully and I'm done some of you have never met Jesus at the mercy seat you're trying to get saved by your works your baptism your church membership that candlestick is worthless if you don't go to the mercy seat that oil is not for you if you don't go to the mercy seat. You need to meet Christ at the mercy seat as a sinner and say, I need your sacrificial payment on Calvary to be the payment for my sins. Come into my heart and save me and take me to heaven when I die. And the very second that you go to Christ and you accept Christ as your personal Savior, listen very carefully. What he does is the Holy Spirit comes and or Christ comes and he saves your soul. Holy Spirit moves inside. Now everything that I've preached today applies to you. But none of what I preach today means a thing to you until you meet Jesus at the mercy seat. Are you saved? If you died right now, do you know you go to heaven? You say, I think so. I didn't ask if you think so. Do you know it? Do you know that you're a sinner on your way to hell? And that your sins, there's a payment on that sin that is death in a place called hell? But that Christ made the payment for you. That's why there's a mercy seat. His blood's applied for your sins. Now why don't you accept him today? So you can get the guides you need in life. Father, oh my God, I'm thankful for just a little sacred truth you put in the book of Exodus. A lot of times we, we just glaze over these things. Boy, great truth right there. Help us to not miss church. Help us not to miss the Bible reading. Help us to yield to your Holy Spirit. Help us, I pray. Heads are bowed, eyes.